Hi, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank all of you for making the time to tune in um, for Gutman Library's uh, first virtual book talk. Uh, this is new territory for us, and as much as we wish we could all be in person together right now, uh, this is the next best thing. Um, I would like to welcome Scott Sider and Darren Graves. Scott Sider is an alum of the college and the Ed School. He's currently Associate Professor of Applied Developmental and Educational Psychology at Boston College. Uh, Darren Graves is an alum of the Ed School as well. He is Associate Professor of Education and Social Work at Simmons University. Uh, Schooling for Critical Consciousness addresses how schools can help Black and Latinx youth resist the negative effect of racial injustice and challenge its root causes. Based on a four-year longitudinal study examining how five different mission-driven urban high schools foster critical consciousness among their students. Scott and Darren, uh, you can take it from here. And uh, before I actually hand it over to you, I put uh, some information in the chat box if everyone can uh, uh, take a look at it. It's 40% um, um, off a uh, special offer. We have a promo code for the book. Uh, if you can, uh, if you are interested in purchasing the book, you can either call uh, the number in the chat bo box or um, go to the website and the offer expires on June 1st. All right, I'll hand it over to you, uh, Scott and Darren. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Marianne. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much uh, for attending uh, this virtual book, book talk, this first ever uh, Government Library book talk and it's so, such an honor. Um, to participate. Um, and so uh, thank you all once again. Uh, my name is Darren Graves, um, uh, Associate Professor of Social Work and Education at Simmons University, and I'll be presenting with my co-author Scott Sider. Um, and so we will um, just jump right in. Today we're going to talk about, we have this wonderful opportunity to talk about our book, uh, Schooling for Critical Consciousness. Um, so we're just going to dive right in so we can do this as uh, quickly as, oh sorry, as quickly as possible. Sorry, my screen's a little weird. Here we go. So we're just, this is gonna be an overview of what we're gonna do um, during this presentation. We'll give you, we'll start off with a introduction to critical consciousness. What does that mean? How are we conceptualizing it? Um, then we'll move into looking at um, five different tools for fostering critical consciousness that we uh, discovered as we were doing our research. And then at the end, we'll have, a, have some time for some questions, uh, comments, and feedback. Um, so that's how we're gonna do this. Um, uh, I'm just gonna launch right in and uh, we'll go from there. So critical consciousness, there's a lot of different ways to think about and define critical consciousness. We, we have decided to go with the uh, definition in, uh, that uh, Paulo Freire used. So Paulo Freire, um, famous uh, critical, you know, father of critical pedagogy, um, did a lot of work working with Brazilian migrant workers and, and came to realize that the, that, that the tools um, for uh, learning about, uh, to, get, to get them motivated to think about how to transform their conditions, um, that, they, that, that learning, um, that, that schooling and learning how to read and learning how to do other um, uh, activities around uh, educating oneself was, was a way to get, uh, get folks motivated to, become, to help them transform uh, their society and their conditions. So we're defining critical consciousness as the ability to recognize oppressive social forces uh, shaping society and then take action against them. And we really want you to focus um, on both of those things. I don't know why that just flipped on me for a second, sorry. Um, and and uh, we want you to focus on this notion of both the recognition and the action piece. And we'll, th we'll throw in the third piece there in a minute, but this notion of being able to uh, recognize what it is that you're actually trying to transform, what are the, sy what are the systems in place, the, the power dynamics in place, and then using that uh, recognition, that ab ability to see that, to then do something about it, to change um, society. And, and we, we've, we've you, many of us who know Freire have heard this uh, you know, you know, you know, phrase that he talked about in terms of reading the word in order to read the world. So. It, it makes 
uh, the action, the the act of being educated and the act of being schooled as a as an explicitly political uh, practice. This is not just learning to read things, um, to learning to for learning to read things' sake, but it's a it's a way to be able to transform um, the conditions on the ground that that tend to uh, give power and privilege to some and and not to many others. In terms of why critical consciousness matters, ooh, why does it keep, oh, there it is. In terms of why critical consciousness matters, um, a few things. I mean, one, we see, we, we actually found that, yes, so pa Freire was talking a lot about critical, crit critical consciousness development as a means to you know, transform society, and that's the ultimate goal, according to Freire. There's a lot of research, right, that shows that critical consciousness development is also associated with a lot of um, other types of um, outcomes that if we as educators um, are, are very much interested in. So we've a lot of research that shows that critical consciousness development is associated with things like uh, better self-esteem, more political engagement, um, uh, diff uh, professional aspirations, definitely academic engagement. We actually found, you'll see here in our, in our child development paper over here, that we actually found some links between uh, critical consciousness development and higher academic achievement. Um, and so uh, these are all different outcomes that I think many educators and folks who work with young folks are, are interested in, in, in uh, achieving. And, and, and in terms of how or wh why that happens, Sean Ginwright talks a lot about the ways in which critical consciousness, uh, development of critical consciousness becomes sort of like a psychological armor for the, uh, against the uh, forces of, oppressive forces that folks might be uh, trying to navigate. And so in other words, that critical consciousness will help folks be resilient and be able to heal, right, in the face of things like racism and other types of oppressive forces. Um, and so let me move to the next slide here. I, I seem to keep losing my ability. There we go, thank you. Um, and so in t this, what you see on the screen right now is a framework that we uh, that we learned from the, the folk, uh, uh, Rod Watts and Matt Deemer and others, um, that it became the framework for us thinking about what critical consciousness actually is and, and the different components to it. If you remember from the Freire's definition, um, it was this ability to recognize and then um, take action against uh, oppressive forces. And so in, the, in, the, in, in Watts and Deemer and Voigt's uh, framework, the one that we employed, we, we, we like this three uh, component uh, model of critical consciousness. One that has, yes, social analysis, um, that, that, re definitely rec that definitely speaks to that notion of recognizing the opp oppressive forces. We also have this notion of political agency, right? This notion of your, your sense and ability that you are able to actually do something, right? In order to change and transform the conditions um, in, your, in your context and in your society. Um, and then the third piece around then taking action, doing, actually doing something about this. And we'll, and we'll just keep going to show us, right? And so the social analysis piece um, in terms of a defin definition is the ability to name and analyze social, political, and economic forces that contribute to inequality and inequity. This is just a, a, a small example from one of the schools we were in where they were reading um, The Bluest Eye and they used the, the, a, a critical reading of the bluest eye is a way to start to analyze different types of forces, in this case around racism, I think especially in terms of internalized racism and things around beauty standards. So social analysis is this ability to recognize, analyze um, these forces that are at play. Political agency, right, is the belief that one has the capacity to affect social political change. And this is one that we found really fascinating, interesting in our studies We'll talk more about this, the, the project in a second. But this is just an example from a school that we, that we studied where the, the, the leaders, the adults, um, the administration in the school um, empowered the students, gave the students the opportunity to make changes to some of the uh, school policies that they felt were inequitable um, or unfair. And this is just an example where the students uh, came together, organized to make some what they thought would be reasonable changes to their dress code policy. And we'll talk about the ways in which that then helped students feel like they actually had the ability to make changes both inside their school and beyond. And then social action is just, you know, a wide range of activities 
that you know that folks will do to resist and challenge oppressive forces. We'll talk more about the, we'll show more what this looks like as we get into the presentation. And this is just a quick example from a school that we studied where um, a uh, European uh, consulate had basically put a travel ban or a travel warning to the community that this that, the, that these students' school was located in, and um, this is just them after after doing some work and some research and some organizing. Um, meeting the, the the consul general of that country, advising him and urging him to uh, uh, change that uh, that policy. So our study, right? What what were we interested in? We were really, you know, we as educators, we, we Scott and I as educators, as parents, um, we were really interested in thinking about in this current context, right? And this started. We started this project. Uh, uh, way back, I think in 2014, if I remember correctly, right? It's been a while now. But um, we were really interested in, you know, given all the, especially uh, sort of popular attention that was given to things like Black Lives Matter, the killing of unarmed Black folks, um, other types of um, social inequities and, and racial and class inequities that were really being put at the forefront of our, our consciousness as a country, we were really interested in like, well, you know, A, how are young folks making sense of any of this, right? Um, and more importantly, what were schools, if anything, doing to help students make any sense of this, much less give them the tools to think about how they, to, to be able to transform these conditions. And so our research question is, what role can schools and educators play in fostering youth critical consciousness? So how do we do this? We went to five different uh, high schools in this case. Um, and we were looking at high schools that had explicit missions around either developing civic development and or critical consciousness development. Um, and we wanted, and we were, chose those schools and we wanted to see schools that were intentionally doing this work and to see how effective it was and in what ways they were effective. Um, and we also went into this knowing that uh, there was probably not going to be a one way that this could or should look either uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so we were also interested in, in not just finding schools that had you know, a mission to do this work, but we were also interested in finding uh, schools that had a diverse set of pedagogical approaches in terms of doing this work. Um, and so you'll see how that plays out as we start to dive into um, some of our, our, our findings. And what we did is in each of those schools, um, we followed the class of 2017 from their basically their first day of school into their last. Um, and we collected lots of data, as you can see. We collected about five waves of, of quantitative data, right? We uh, quantitated, we did surveys that measured different components of critical consciousness um, from the from very, basically their very, you know, not exactly their first day, but basically their very early days of school. Right, and then at the end of their first year, at the end of their second, at the end of their third, and the end of their fourth, so we could see um, both whether whether growth was happening and and to see trajectories of growth. Um, so that gave us um, the quantitative data. Qualitatively, uh, we collected four waves of interview data. So we 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 got a subset of students, about twelve to fifteen students from each school each year, and at the end, towards the end of each school year, we asked. Uh, a bunch of questions about to get a sense of how um, they were making sense of different forms of of inequality and oppression to get a sense of how if at all the schools were contributing to that understanding um, and so we and we and so we interviewed students in that regard we interviewed faculty um, and then we did many many days as you can see of full days of going into each of these schools and observing in classrooms and in other places to see what we were seeing in terms of what approaches, what um, pedagogically, curricularly, and otherwise that these schools were taking in order to help um, intentionally help students build a uh, critical consciousness. And I think this is where I am going to pass it off to Scott now to talk a little bit more. Great. Um, great. Well, first of all, thank you so much to everyone for for being here. It's really exciting to get a chance to to talk to all of you. Um, Darren gave you kind of a good overview of sort of the, the concept of critical consciousness and sort of the, the bare bones of our, of our project. We're gonna spend the rest of the time talking about sort of findings and practices in the schools. Um, we, we like to talk about sort of methods and we're happy to answer any questions about that, but we figured folks would be most interested in sort of just seeing 
see, you know, getting as clear a picture as possible about what the schools in our project were, were doing. And so, so we're going to talk to you about five different sort of tools for fostering critical consciousness that we saw across the schools in our project, but sort of particular schools doing particularly well. And um, we'll kind of bounce back and forth a little bit and try to show you um, what that, what that looks like. And so. There we go. Okay, so first I'm going to talk a little bit about, about this tool that we call introducing a framework. And, and one of the, and a number of the schools in our study sort of used this, this idea of introducing a framework to foster youth critical consciousness. One school, a school we call Make the Road Academy, did a particularly nice job of this, and I think it's particularly illustrative. Um, so Make the Road Academy was a school that explicitly named itself after Paulo Freire. Um, this is a, this picture of Paulo Freire was a mural in the, the main lobby of the school, and you can see the school's mission. Was you know this was probably the school that most ex that unequivocally like most explicitly linked itself to the idea of critical consciousness and and to the work of Paula Freire and in fact like really sort of featured Freire's problem posing educational approach in in their classes um, which you know and by problem posing educational approach I mean you know, sort of taking a a very egalitarian perspective on the teacher student relationship where the teacher and student sort of work together as equals to to address real world problems within their within their community and. And so one of the things we noticed in our survey data um, when we looked across um, the five schools in our study was that the young people at Make the Road Academy, and, and I should say that um, all of the students in all of the schools um, were, were predominantly black and Latinx. Um, and so when we, when we looked at the data um, from across our five schools and our five waves of survey data, we saw that the students attending Make the Road Academy demonstrated the highest, um, finished high school with the highest awareness of systemic racism in comparison to their peers across the, the broad sample of you know, nearly 350 students. And, and by systemic racism, I'm talking about the, the recognition of how particular policies, laws, and cultural practices can privilege or obstruct the success of particular racial ethnic groups over others. And so, so you know, in, in short, like the young people at Make the Road Academy, as they were graduating high school and getting ready to go out into the world, they, were, they demonstrated significantly higher awareness of systemic racism than, than their peers at the other schools. And for us, like within our sort of critical consciousness model, that's, you know, that sort of fits into that social analysis piece. Like there was something, something about the young people at Make the Road Academy that was allowing them to sort of engage in deeper social analysis than their peers across the broader sample. Um, and so we then turn to our qualitative data to see like in what ways um, the school might be contributing to that, you know, and, 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 and it should go without saying, but I'll, I'll make sure to say it, that, you know, neither Darren nor I never thought to ourselves that school is the only, you know, source of, you know, sort of source of students' critical conscious development, or maybe even the most powerful source of critical conscious development. You know, unequivocally, young people's critical consciousness is being fostered by their parents, by other community members, by their peers, by their faith institutions, by out-of-school organizations. But, but we were sort of particularly interested in this study um, with the question of what role can school play in, in fostering youth critical and so one of the things we found in our qualitative data was that all of the young people at Make the Road Academy took a class as ninth graders called social engagers. Um, and, they, and it was, you know, it was a class that met five days a week, the same way that math or English or history did. And in this social engagement class, one of the most powerful units that both the students and the teacher of the course pointed to was, was this unit on, on the three eyes of oppression. And, and so as part of the unit, very early on in, in the course, students learned that oppression could come in sort of three different personal in nature, it can be institutional in nature, it can be internalized in nature, and students did a lot of work to, to really unpack those, those definitions of, of different types of oppression and to look at different examples of them, you know, through, through a number of different activities. And so, for example, um, if you look at the, the picture on the left hand, hand side of the screen, one of the assignments after students had learned about these three eyes of oppression was to, was to draw a picture. They were sort of working in groups and they had to come up with an illustration of a community that was sort of being, um, being sort of hurt by these different types of oppression, you can see um, a picture by one of the um, by one of the groups, at, you know, in this social engagement course, and you can see that the students have put in all different types of, of of oppression within this within this photo within this within this drawing. And then, after the students drew that illustration, they then studied um, the Black Panther Party's platform for for self defense, which was a um, which was a document um, created in 1966 by Black Panther Party founders. Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, where, where these two sort of founders laid out the, the conditions necessary for, for Black people to survive and thrive within the United States. And after the young people kind of studied this document and, you know, and engaged in a number of activities around understanding this document, 
they actually drew another picture of the same community where those three eyes of oppression had been replaced by, by the Black Panther Party's 10 point platform. And, and, and so those, that just gives you a sense of how the social engagement class sort of worked to, to foster young people's understandings of how oppression works. And, and in terms of like, well, what kind of effect did, did an activity like that have? So as, as Darren mentioned, we did interviews each year of high school with, um, with a subset of young people in, in these schools. And so one of those young people was, um, was, a, young, was a young person we, named, we call Michael in our, in our book. And as a 12th grader, you know, we, we were talking to Michael about oppression. And he, like a lot of students that make the Road Academy, actually referenced learning from ninth grade in the social engagement class. And Michael said, you know, like in our city, it's a lot of, you know, and so we, we had asked a question about sort of where do you see, like, how do you, where do you see a racial oppression in, you know, in, in your life or in your community? And, and Michael pointed out, he said, hey, like in our city, there's a lot of chicken shacks everywhere. You can always find a chicken shack here. But if you go out to like the suburbs or something like that, you're not going to find one nowhere around. And I should say he, he explicitly mentioned a predominantly white suburb just outside his own city for, for purposes of confidentiality. I'm, I'm not naming that here. But, um, but he said, like, you might find a Whole Foods or like a farmer's market or something like that in, that in that suburb. The options of everything is just much different. And it seems like certain things are put where they are put for a reason. And, and then when we sort of asked Michael, well, you know, to, to tell us a little bit more about where that understanding of the world had come from, he said, well, freshman year, when we was in the social engagement class, it made me think about stuff differently. And once I started thinking about it, you start putting the pieces together and you start noticing like nothing happens just because. Like it's all for some reason. Like somebody's benefiting from everything, somebody's not benefiting from everything. It's set up this way for a certain reason. And, and I think that, you know, both, I think both Darren and I and other members of our research team would say that's a, that's a pretty sophisticated understanding of, of institutional forms of oppression in particular. Um, you know, the ways in which, um, the ways in which sort of resources, you know, like nutritious food, you know, are, are available to different communities, um, you know, in, you know, in, in, or unavailable to particular communities. And, and so for us, that was, you know, that was an example of Michael kind of, A, sort of demonstrating a pretty, a pretty sophisticated awareness of institutional oppression, and also pointing us back to the social engagement class. And, and what was really interesting about Make the Road Academy was because all of the students had, had taken social engagement as ninth graders and been exposed to this framework, this three eyes of oppression framework, what that meant was that teachers, students, other teachers in ninth grade, but also 10th grade, 11th and 12th grade, knew that that was sort of a body, an understanding of the world that all of their students possessed. And so what we saw at Make the Road Academy that we thought was really powerful and that really amplified the impact of the social engagement class was that other teachers would then draw upon that same framework in order to make points or sort of facilitate learning within their own academic subjects. And so, so Darren noted the 10th grade English class where the students were studying The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. And that was a place where the, the 10th grade English teacher really sort of focused in on the, on the idea of internalized oppression and the way in which, the way in which different types of racism and racial injustice in the United States can contribute to internalized oppression, you know, in, and, and the main character in The Bluest Eye is a character, you know, who is, Who's, who's really experiencing that internalized oppression in the way she's contending with dominant standards of beauty. And, and you can see, um, you can see like in, you know, the, the, a, a, some student work there in terms of the, the cover of the book, but also some student work in terms of thinking about the ways in which, the ways in which we are all impacted by dominant standards of beauty in our society. And, and that's just one example of, of, of teachers across the board at Make the Road Academy drawing upon that framework that students were introduced to as ninth graders to to facilitate learning in their in their respective subjects, and so I think I'm going to turn back to hand off back to Darren to talk a little bit about a second uh, a second tool that we that we observed out of the project. Thank you, Scott. Um, so another key tool for us that we found in terms of fostering critical consciousness was this notion of uh, students uh, teaching students, so students being given the opportunity um, one way or another to help to, to teach other students and bring them along the way in terms of fostering and developing critical consciousness. There we go. Let's see if I can make the thing turn now. Oh, maybe Scott, yeah, can you, I don't know what I just did there. Uh, yes, okay, thank you, I got it, right? So we're gonna talk about Leadership High School. Um, and, and their mission was to educate socially responsible students uh, for a life of active and engaged citizenship. So they had a real, this school had a real act, uh, action civics model um, for uh, uh, as a pedagogical approach. 
Um, and you can see here, just this is just a, 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 one of the bulletin boards, different, uh, it's hard to see the, the details, but it's just giving different ways in which the school uh, felt students could be able to like be actively engaged um, both in and out, and, and especially outside the walls of their school. Um, let's see again, I don't know, I'm losing, okay, I'm sorry, I'm, somehow I'm losing the opportunity, the ability to share, uh, to, okay, here we go. Sorry about that. So from, from our quantitative data, you can see that, that students at, uh, at a Leadership High um, uh, 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 sort of had a higher, uh, demonstrated a higher uh, commitment to activism um, then, you know, our five featured schools, and you can see basically minus the second year, uh, a growth um, in terms of how much uh, commitment to activism they, they showed over those, over those years. Um, so we, that, that showed us uh, quantitatively, you know, that something uh, uh, you know, special was happening here in terms of commitment to activism. And then uh, what I'll, I'll go to the next slide. Yeah. And, and so what did that, how did that come to be in, 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 uh, from our perspective? So one of the big uh, p uh, uh, pieces of this was the sociology of change class that, that all seniors uh, took at the school. Um, and so, in and, and which they got, you know, some, some important, uh, you know, theoretical and, uh, and also practical um, uh, guidance around how to, to be active and to do activism, you know, in their communities. You can see that they were, um, for those of us who are Harvard folks will recognize um, the, the work of Marshall Gantz and, and his um, organizing theory um, that these students at this school were, um, uh, were made aware of and, 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 were, and learned about. Um, and, then, and then utilized some of the, the learning from that, that class and that, and that theory to then think about how to then uh, do different types of activism inside and outside of the school. You can see here um, different hashtags and ways in which you know, students were thinking about how to then, you know, take um, the things that they were learning and, and bring it outside of, their, of the walls of their school. I'm going to go to the next slide. And so what, and what did that result in? What that resulted in were these things called Change the World Projects, were really like these uh, seminal, you know, end of the, you know, uh, end of their basically time at Leadership High projects that each student had to engage in um, as part of their, basically their graduation requirement. Um, and so each, basically each student um, would do uh, research, um, then begin to do some organizing, and then ultimately implement some sort of action um, outside the walls of their school. Um, and so on the left-hand side of the picture, or at least my left-hand side, you can see uh, students who are laying on the ground in front of a, a, a police precinct, and this was students um, uh, or, who organized a, a die-in, um, you know, responding to police violence and, 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 the, and the killing of unarmed uh, Black folks. And so that was one type of example of a type of action that, you know, this a particular student then got other students involved in, right? Um, the picture on the right, which is a particularly fascinating project, was um, organized by a student who sort of sitting at the end of that table who was sitting around, uh, you can see uh, three adults basically were sitting with this student who were community elders and uh, community members and, and, and other inf uh, uh, adult influencers in the community. And it was a community, and it was a project around gentrification. So the school was uh, located in a community that was going through very, uh, you know, very big gentrification process. Um, students, this particular student and others had issues with this and they wanted to organize a community panel um, to help uh, 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 educate and then organize and activate the community around uh, pushing back against the, the, the negative effects of a gentrification in this particular community. Um, and so we, and then we, and then the thing about that that was so fascinating was the ways in which um, these projects, um, though they were initiated and organized, you know, by seniors, um, had impacts on folks and students below them and around them, right? And and it was and it was and we also just heard in a lot of the interviews the ways in which um, these projects had an impact on both the, the students themselves and then the larger school community, right? So here we have Angela, who was an eleventh grader, right, at Leadership High, who said, you know, some of the seniors had to make a, a change the world project in order to graduate, and their project was like was like make some kind of change. 
with like police violence. So we basically went on a march, I guess. We went to a precinct and then we just stood there with some posters and some of us laid on the ground, you know, and we stayed there for a while, okay? So that's, that's the student describing her, um, their experience of being participating in this project that they didn't even organize themselves, right? And so you can imagine, right, what that does for students as they're then moving into uh, their opportunity to organize. And then in the, in the second part of the quote, it said, it made me kind of feel like what I'm doing may change something, you know? Maybe people are like gonna start seeing what we did as something, you know, important. And that, I mean, that kind of quote, that part of the quotation is very powerful to us, right? Because that speaks to this notion of like, that, they, that you, the, the ability, the opportunity to do this work then makes them feel like this work, doing this work actually does something. It actually can have an impact, right? Um, and so that we, we can see that clearly um, in the words here from Angela. And then we're gonna show you one more quote um, from a ninth grader named Sokuro who um, says, I feel like the 12th graders are teaching us their way so that we're able to, when we're able to get the 12th grade to have a change the world project, that actually means something. And so the power, right? So you can imagine like maybe the very first time the school did these projects, right? And then the students below are starting to experience it. But then you, the more these projects go and the more students are seeing right the folks above them do these projects the more motivating it becomes for students to do the work and then the, I, I assume more and we we saw more the more sophisticated and powerful these these uh projects became because the modeling and the teaching from the students who came before them just keeps funneling down to the students below and below um so uh yeah i think right now well then we're gonna i'm gonna uh, give it back to scott to talk about another a uh, common tool that we saw in terms of uh, fostering critical consciousness. So, so a third tool that we want to talk a little bit about is, is the ability, the students' op opportunities to affect change within their school community. There we go. And so a third high school in our study was a school we call a spirit to high school. Um, and I should say, you know, if Make the Road Academy sort of was pattern, it pedagogically sort of took a problem posing approach and leadership high school, which Darren talked about, took an action civics approach. Espiritu High School took what's known as a, um, was a member of the Coalition of Essential Schools and took what's known as a habits of mind approach, which is this, this highly inquiry driven approach to, to learning where students are sort of, where, the, where educators and students are working together to foster particular habits of mind. And, um, and so that was, the, that was the pedagogical orientation from which Espiritu High School um, did its work. And this is, you know, there's a picture here, what is my voice, how can I use it from one of the, um, from one of the social studies classes within the, within the school. And I think that really exemplifies um, one, of the, one of the school's commitments. And so when we looked at um, our survey data, we saw that, um, that one of our measures of political agency, like this measure called the youth sociopolitical control measure, that, that the young people at a spiritual high school demonstrated the steepest growth and actually finished high school with the highest levels of, of, of feelings of political agency. And just as a reminder, like political agency is the belief that you have the capacity to affect social or political change. And so, you know, so within our model, like, you know, social analysis is necessary to understand oppressive social forces. Um, social action is necessary to, you know, to engage in sort of actually challenging those forces. But, but, but the bridge between the two is, is, polit is, 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 is political agency, the belief that, that, you know, once you come to sort of understand, you know, uh, you know some, uh, about some form of oppression, that you have the power as an individual and as part of a collective to engage in actions that can that can that can challenge that oppressive social force, and so so that's why we you know we and others have, have perceived political agency to be an important piece of critical consciousness development, and and so we we're curious to see well what's going on at a spiritual high school that might be contributing to young people's um, feelings of political agency, and and one of the really interesting things that we found at spiritual high school was that in the eleventh grade, all of the students took a civics class, and one of the explicit units within the civics class maybe unit was for students to, to work together to look through the school handbook and to identify a school policy that they perceived to be unjust or unfair. And, um, and they then sort of would work as a class to try to affect change within the, within the school. And so, so we were following the class of 2017. And so in their junior year when they were taking civics, one of the classes that we were following, they, um, they, they chose the electronic device policy for the school, which at the time was, was pretty draconian. It sort of said effectively, like when you're in school, like put away your devices, like we don't use electronics in, in school. And the students felt like that was a policy that had become outdated and didn't, um, you know, didn't allow them to maximize their learning. And, and so what the students did also, I'll stay here for a minute. What the students did 
was um, they, they, they embarked together on, on you know, several weeks of research, like researching the ways in which electronic devices and social media and tablets and so on can contribute to, um, you know, to, to powerful and effective learning. And they put that all together into a presentation. And, and, and in the presentation, they put forth a suggestion for a new policy. And so, so they did quite a bit of work over several weeks. They sort of researched the way that electronic devices can impact learning. They work together to come up with a new proposal for a policy. They put together a presentation, you know, sort of sharing the research and the new proposal, and and then ultimately delivered that that um, that presentation to the to the to the entire faculty of their school. And um, you know, and and it was fascinating to watch the process play out as students sort of you know, and so I should say the the policy, the new policy that students sort of decided would make sense for their school was they came up with this idea of like a um, of kind of a um, like a technology pass, a media pass that all students would be issued, and um, and that gave you the right to use sort of your you know technology and media at certain times within the school day, and there were you know and there were things that you could do that would result in you losing your media pass, and and we really watched the students engage in debate on everything from you know at what points in the school day should you be allowed to use your media pass to should the media pass be something that you you know wear around your neck on a lanyard, and if so, like. Should the school be paying for the lanyard? Should the students be paying for the lanyards? I mean, questions big and small were sort of worked through by the students in the process of doing their research and putting together their proposal and their presentation. And ultimately, this is just sort of a little slice of the presentation that they gave to the, to the faculty. That, you know, it says this is from our book. In summary, a young man explained at the end of the 20 minute presentation, the technology policy is outdated and incorrect, particularly in regard to tablets. So the media pass allows the use of phones and headphones at certain times. There's no media pass at lunch because this is when we need to be more social and put away electronics and it helps us prepare for college because in college you have more freedom to decide what you want to do. And, and it was really fascinating. And like as folks who were sort of watching the students put together this proposal and, and watching the teacher watch the students, you know, I could tell, you know, there were certainly places where the students came to decisions that didn't necessarily align with what I thought might sense or what the teacher made sense, you know, as I was sitting in the back or what the teacher thought might have made sense. But you can tell that this really was like where this came from the students. It was generated by the students, and and the teacher really gave the students autonomy to to put to get, put forth the proposal that they thought made the most sense. And the entire faculty of the school listened to the proposal, applauded, um, thanked them, and then a few days later, they wrote a letter to the to the civics class. You know, they said, "Congratulations on a well done presentation." You know, we you know we have a couple questions that we're hoping you can respond to. And this is just a few of them. They said, you know, you presented an article about the benefits of headphones, but there are other studies that indicate students achieve lower test scores with music. Did you do selective research? Another question was, you know, why encourage or allow headphones from 3 to 4 p.m. at a time when students are working on homework, often now unproductively? Will this improve their efforts or will time be spent searching or will time be spent searching for the perfect song? And there are probably 10 or 11 questions that, um, that the faculty asked the civics class to respond to. And as a result, the students had to sort of go back into the research and um, and prepare a you know a written response to the faculty about um, you know in response to these questions you know and um, and then ultimately and this is what I thought was was so was so well done on the part of the school what the faculty voted to do was to was to ex adopt the student's proposal for the remainder of the school year and, and they effectively said we're going to try out your proposal you know regarding technologies for the rest of the school year. And if it and if things go smoothly, then this will become the official policy. We'll replace the you know the old handbook policy with the the policy that you've put forth. And if it doesn't work out, then then we'll go back to the you know to the the old policy until such time as you know students or faculty or both can can come up with a new one. And and I can only tell you, and I'll show you a quote in just a second that kind of exemplifies this: that that the students felt incredibly empowered by this ability, this opportunity to affect change within their within their school. So just just one of the young ladies in that class, Janelle. She said, I never really thought that schools like listen to students, but a spirit who really listens to his students and being able to make change here, it does impact my future because I believe like if I can make change within a small group, I can make change over a big group throughout a long period of time. You know, and I would say that when, when Darren and I sort of began the, the project, I think we weren't sure whether the ability to affect change within your school community would feel meaningful to students in terms of their ability to affect change in, in, in the in broader community and other communities outside of school. And I think one of our one of the things we learned over the course of the project from Espiritu, but from a number of other schools as well, is that you know is that for for the young people we were learning from, their school community is as real a community as any other community they're a part of. And so the opportunity to make change and meaningful change within their school absolutely felt like a like a victory and like something that was contributing to their feelings of political agency. And um, and so that's another example of a 
of a, um, of, a, of, a, of a tool that we saw schools using to, um, to foster students' critical consciousness. And I'm gonna turn back to Darren for, um, for an, uh, this might be our last um, example because we wanna make sure we have time for questions. Hey, I, I don't mean to interrupt, uh, but Scott, there seems to be a problem with your microphone. Oh no. You wanna okay. take a look at that? Of course, Thank we'll, you. We'll, Darren can go on as I am. Um, yes, for sure. Um, so yeah, we, we might not be able to get to the teachers getting personal because we want to save some time for questions. So let me just d dive into the uh, real world assignments. Here we go. Uh, there it is. Okay, so we're going to talk about Community Academy. Its mission was to, de was to develop in students the knowledge, skills, and commitment to envision a, a vision of a better world and, a, and work to achieve it. Um, I, I, this this school used uh, what we would call, I think, more of an expeditionary learning a uh, pedagogical approach. It's it's similar to an action civics, and it has you know it's very project based. Um, and so, um, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna dive right in here. Um, let's see. Come on now. Oh boy, why does this keep happening to me? All right, here we go. Okay, um, much like the. Um, the Leadership Academy, the, these students also showed a uh, pretty high commitment to activism relative to the other schools. Um, so that, that's what we're seeing here in the quantitative data. I want to dive into the, the qualitative. Um, so the real world assignments, right? So I, I talked a little bit about uh, uh, this, this example earlier. Um, so this, uh, uh, this school, Community Academy, it was in a neighborhood that a, a uh, a, a, uh, a, a European country, had, their, their consulate had basically, uh, in giving uh, 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 advice uh, to uh, the, their folks, their countrymen who were coming to visit the, uh, the, the city that this uh, school was uh, uh, located in, they, they, they deemed the community that the school was located in as sort of a no-go zone, too dangerous, not a place to go, you know, a place that you should fear for your safety. Um, the students at the school uh, found out about this, um, and were uh, and, and and the adults in the school found out about this too, right? And, and were not happy about this. Um, saw it as very inequitable. Saw it as essentially racist, um, and so uh, embarked upon a, a project uh, in which they studied these issues, um, looked at the issue of, of their community in particular, and then organized themselves to then ultimately, the, as you can see, as part of the school project. The students are there are are here confronting uh, the general con the consul general of that country, um, uh, advising them to uh, to change this policy, um, which I believe they actually it did, which was a, which was a nice um, uh, uh, result for that for that particular project. Um, they also did a, a, a whole unit, for example, on you know uh, the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States. Um, and thinking about, you know, whether should, should it be a state, should it be its own independent you know, country, should it, you know, it have be in this liminal state that it's in right now as, as a basically a, essentially a colony. Um, and then each student um, basically ended up writing letters um, to their local uh, Congress people with their opinions about what uh, the, the relationship, what an equitable relationship between the US and Puerto Rico should actually be. Um, let me keep going. In the interest of time. So here we, and then of course we got to ask students about these, about the, their, their work in this regard. And so here we have Dana, a ninth grade student from Community Academy say, saying, I feel like it gives us a voice because we're writing letters to senators and representatives. And I feel like we send out those letters. Uh, if we send out those letters, that will make some type of improvement to what's happening, right? So here again, we, we, we loved the, the, this notion of the students um, doing the work and then feeling like whether it was, you know, completely uh, successful or not, giving them a sense that they can affect change and that change does happen when they do this work. Um, I think that's where we're, we're going to stop it right now. We, we, if we had a little bit more time, we talk a little bit about the ways in which teachers uh, got personal with students. I'll just, I'll, I'll kind of summarize. We did find, you know, a few, uh, uh, a few cases where teachers, some white teachers who uh, recognize their own positionality and their own privilege in terms of working with students of color and, and putting themselves in a position to be um, reciprocal teachers and learners with their students of color and reframe the way that they do um, school and taught things like African-American literature or other things. We also saw 
uh, teachers who were of color, African American or otherwise, who would share personal experiences um, with their uh, st uh, students when they were the, the student's age as ways of helping students realize that they're not alone in this and these struggles and thinking about how to you know, analyze, navigate, or challenge these issues. And so that's, if we had more time, we'd talk a little bit more about that, but that's what happens in that section of the presentation. But I think, given that we only have a few minutes left, I think what we're gonna try and do now is open it up for some questions yeah. um, from the, uh, the uh, audience. But before I do that, I just wanna make, give, acknowledge, obviously the students, teachers, and school leaders who allowed us to come in their space um, to do this research. We're really honored to be able to just have folks uh, share those, uh, their, their spaces and their experience and their perspectives with us. You see we had a very uh, robust uh, research team, Dr. Leah Elmin, Dr. Shelby Clark, Dr. Lauren Kelly, Dr. Pauline Jeanette, Dr. Madora Suter, Dr. Jalene Tamarat, Melanie Cabral, Catherine Gramagna, uh, uh, Jamie Johansson, Syra Malhotra, and Jennifer Young, who are all parts of this team and then of course our funding from uh the national education uh academy of education spencer foundation templeton foundation and uh bu undergraduate research opportunities program um so i think that being said i think what we want to do now yes and of course we want to make sure again that you if you're interested in the book that you can uh order it 40 percent off with the code right there but i think that being said i want to open it up for questions i'm just going to play with this a little bit because i don't want to I think I want to, yes, I want to stop sharing and I want to, and I see that we have some questions in the Q&A. Um, and one in the chat. And one in the chat. So I think um, what I will do is I see this first question where it says, where did Make the Road Academy get curriculum for their social engagement course? Was it developed within the school or did they draw on other resources? Scott, you presented on Make the Road Academy, so I'll let you, uh, you want to handle that one first? Sure, sir, would you just read the question, say the question again? I was making yes. sure my microphone was working. It said, where did Make the Road Academy get the curriculum for the social engagement course? Was it developed? Oh, that's such a, that's such a, good, oh, that's such a good question. And it did, I, I'd have to look it up. It did come, it was, you know, it was somewhat self-designed, but they had taken it from, from something in particular. I mean, I, I'm tempted to say maybe like the teaching tolerance curriculum um, that the Southern Poverty Law Center puts out, but I, I have it. And so, um, who, if, 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 you know, I, because I, I sort of downloaded it at one point, like, and so if someone, if someone wants to reach out to me via email, I can actually look it up and, and, and send you that info. Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, looks like another question said, did we, did we find any interaction between rising uh, critical consciousness and stereotypes? That's a really good question. That's not something that we, that we looked at in particular. Um, so we didn't, um, look at that intentionally. I could see why, why you might have that question. Um, I, I think part of, of the, the ways in which stereotype threat is reduced is by, you know, uh, giving folks um, what, what I think uh, Claude Steele would call identity, a sense of identity safety. And, that, and, what that, and what that I think involves is some of the things that we've learned uh, in, in this project, which is to like, you know, expose folks to ways in which you know the you know these i these problematic ideas that underpin the constructions particular race groups um are problematic and then give folks um uh, norm and, and give folks examples and, and both you know that normalize um the you know more more critical ways of viewing you know specific racial groups so for example with african americans one way to re reduce stereotype threat is to, is to give folks you know examples of where high achievement uh, amongst African Americans is is uh, normalized, um, and so we did see uh, things like that, but we didn't look for that particular um, connection uh, from a research perspective. But it's a great question, and I think one that we need that that, that would be nice to to um, to look at further moving forward. So, and we did um, ask. Oh, and yeah, also we did. We did, we did ask students as part of our qualitative protocol. Sometimes we would just ask them like, you know, does, does learning so much about race and racial injustice, does that feel empowering? Does that feel overwhelming? Like just how, you know, like are there ways, you know, and, and, you know, and, and obviously different students answered in different ways. But I mean, I think, I think I came out sort of, you know, from our qualitative interview feeling, you know, our qualitative data feeling like, feeling like critical consciousness is an intervention to reduce stereotype threat. 
right? Like sort of, you know, and, and there is some, there is a little bit of research that actually focuses on stereotype threat on women in mathematics that suggests that sort of learning about the concept of stereotype threat, like reduces stereotype threat for, for, you know, for sort of women in math in sort of that, you know, that, that, that's, that setting that's highly prone to stereotype threat. And, and I think there's ways, and I think that there's ways in which sort of like the social engagement course or other critical conscious interventions that we talked about function, you know, function, had at least had the potential to function similarly. Great. I, I'm trying to do the best that I can to get to all of these questions. I'm going to go to a question from Sean Chambers that says, here's the ever-present assessment question. Teachers feel the pressure to make projects that can be given a letter grade. These projects allow students to demonstrate a lot of hard skills and soft skills, but which subject areas does such a project fall into? Which, grading, which subject area teachers uh, are best at creating rubrics for grading these kinds of projects, or do they just never get graded? Do students in, work in teams? Do they grade each other's contributions? What would you share about grading, right? This is a great question. I like this. So a few things like this, this was not, this was, believe me, like the, what we saw in these schools was not just a project in like making students feel good about themselves, right? This was not just a project in like, oh, let's just, this doesn't help students organize and they'll feel better or let's help them analyze, right? Th these were, these projects, we, you know, we had so little time to talk about these things, but these, all these projects and these examples that we gave were, um, you know, parts of, you know, units, right? That were, um, that, that, that definitely, were that had components that were most definitely graded right and so this was not just like oh you succeed you organized the end right no there were there were many scaffolded steps along the way in terms of you know reading and decoding things analyzing things that they were reading um putting things into action that were that were they were highly scaffolded processes that you yes were graded all along the way um so they were not ungraded project this was not some and we want to make this point very, very clear, right? Because I, I appreciate that this was not extracurricular stuff here. This was not like, oh, in addition to our core stuff, we're going to do this extra other things. These were all activities, projects, units that were deeply embedded into people, into students' core academic courses. English, you know, I'm, gonna say, I'm, I'm just naming things. Social studies, science, math, all of these things, right? look different depending on the school and depending on the, the pedagogical approach, but these were not like separate things. And so we didn't have the time to get in here to show like the, 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 the granular detail of how it started from, a, you know, the beginning of a unit to the end, which yes, you know, ultimately culminated in some sort of either, you know, analytical or, or action oriented project, but yes, very much um, graded along the way and very much integrated into core academic subjects. Some of the things, we, we found it in some of the schools. Um, some of these activities were uh, more in the sort of, you know, sort of co-curricular or extracurricular, um, after school types of activities. But the vast majority of what we saw was us going into, you know, core academic classrooms and, and, and having this work be integrated into the everyday work of doing English or doing social studies or doing math or doing science. I hope that ho I hope that answers the question. Scott, I don't know if you wanted to add into that. No, I think that that that's perfect. Okay. Um, I'm gonna. I see Bradley Dennis's question. I'm gonna read it for you, Scott. Um, have some of these students uh, uh, been uh, followed? Oh, basically followed on high school gra graduation to correlate their exposure to critical consciousness development and and, con and their contributions as well to the success in the larger society. So in other words, I, I think the question, Scott, is, is like, do we, have, did we find anything that showed that after they left the school that then they actually put this critical consciousness action into work beyond the walls of their, beyond the realms of their school projects, right? That's that great, sense? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. We, um, we, we did be try to collect, a, collect data from the students a year after high school. Um, and, and we had sort of mixed success, you know, in the sense that, you know, a year after high school, and, and when the students were in high school, it was very easy to find them, you know, each year to, you know, to do the surveys, to do the interviews. A year later, it was much harder, and we had email addresses, or we had social, you know, we, we, we tried various ways, and so in the end, we, of the 350 students or so who we'd surveyed, we were able to sit, survey 72 of them again. Of the 60 students that we'd interviewed, we were able to interview about 18 of them again, and, um, and so, I can tell you sort of you know, some analyses of that data that like, you know, that, that students, that higher critical consciousness in high school did correlate with, um, you know, with, um, with some higher, with higher forms of, with higher civic activity in, um, in a, year, a year later, whether in college or, or in the workplace. Um, 
and though interestingly not and not as not as much with it, it correlated not as much with some of the social emotional um, competencies that we had sort of put into the into the survey because of you know the research that Darren talked about suggesting that that you know that critical consciousness is you know is it you know plays a protective role in you know in in folks lives and so 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 our our data a year later suggests like heightened civic activity for um for folks who who had higher critical consciousness or higher growth in critical consciousness in high school um we were less able to confirm some of the some of the earlier research about um about critical consciousness as a as a form of sort of you know in, in promoting resilience for instance thank you scott I also see the questions in the, I've been doing a lot of Q&A questions. I see questions in the chat. I'm going to just do one quick one for Keith Catone in the uh, Q&A about the question around, did we see schools that were partnering with community-based organizations or youth-based organizations? Um, I think the answer is yes, but it just depended on the school. Um, I think, you know, sometimes, uh, especially, and I think this was important when, when um, schools were engaging in helping students do activism outside of the school, right? And, and people had concerns about like, you know, students, you know, quote unquote safety or what, what they would be learning from this stuff. Uh, we found that certain schools did a good job of partner, of, of communicating and partnering with community-based organizations to help both maintain students' safety in those, in those particular cases and help them and, and to bring organizations in to help be part of the learning uh, process. So I wish I could give you a more detailed answer, Keith, but the answer is yes, but you know, depending on the school, its particular you know, pedagogical um, orientation and the community was uh, located in. But I, that's a wonderful question. And I think, it's, I think it's something that we could have probably looked at a little bit more intentionally um, in, our, in our research. I'm going into the, the chat and I saw a question, I think from Rebecca Park, um, about I work at a highly diverse school, how might approaches in developing critical consciousness uh, be, be maybe I, I, it'd be different depending on the, the diversity of the school. We've had this question too. I think the question, so if you, if you work in a school that isn't like predominantly black and Latinx, for example, like would this work look the same? The answer is yes and no. I think the, I think the no part is of course, like the, the, the context of, you know, how students and the population are coming at this work due to their own positionality, right, is gonna be different, right? If you're working in a predominantly white school, will this work look exactly the same? Very much, very not so, right? Because then we'd be working from a position of helping students recognize the unearned privilege, right? And then moving from that space. Whereas we, as Scott was saying, we, we assumed, right, that, that many, uh, that students were not, this was not the only place that students were developing critical consciousness from in our, in our study. And so um, we, as, as African-American Latinx students, we, have, we, we pretty much assume that many students were coming in knowing a lot of this stuff one way or another, right? That may or may not be the case with when you have other populations and particularly a predominantly white population. The, the answer is yes, right? In, in the sense that we do think that framework of thinking about, um, analysis, agency, and action is a, is a good framework to, to operate from, given, yes, the different positionalities that folks might be approaching this work from, um, but, we, um, but we still think that that's a good approach, right? A good framework. And I, what I wanna say about this is I think we're basically running out of time, is that this, what we saw in the schools, by the way, was that some schools were doing really good job, right, in terms of the analysis piece, others, we're, we're doing a better job in helping students develop a sense of agency and other schools were doing a better job in terms of helping students uh, do that action piece, right? And what we, what, you know, I think ideally, I think our, our met, and I'm hoping this is gonna answer a bunch of questions that are both in the Q&A and the chat, right? About what does this mean for practice moving forward? I think for us, what we, whether you're a school, a community-based organization, a youth-based organization, this framework can help you give you some targets for what it is you're actually trying to do and helping develop critical consciousness. We thought it would be dangerous, right, to have students who had analytical skills, right? And then we, we talked to, by the way, we talked to some students who said, you know, who, who could analyze things. And then we asked them like, so what do you think you can do about this? And they'd be like, oh, I don't know, like, I'm just a kid. I don't think I can, you know, I may be later in life. And we thought that is, you know, not exactly the outcome we were looking for, especially if you're working from Freire's definition, right? We also saw it being particularly dangerous to have students who were, uh, who were about, you know, who were doing the action, but didn't have, but weren't analyzing, didn't have the analytical skills to figure out what it is exactly that you're organ that you're trying to do, act, you know, act for or against, or what is the the nature of the what are the dynamics that you're actually trying to 
uh, disrupt, right? And, and of course, we definitely wanted students it, 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 to be involved in the action. You have to feel like you are able, that you have the ability to affect that action. And so I think what we would argue is that we'd want uh, educators to focus on all three of those components and then, then think about like, and to figure out ways to be measuring one way or another, whatever makes sense to your school, how that's happening in each of those components. I'm gonna let Scott say a little bit more. Yeah, I think that I think that's I think that's that's well said. It may, and I know we're kind of short short on time, so maybe we'll just maybe we'll just sort of say thank you. We really appreciate all the folks who um who 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 came to came to our our talk. We were excited to continue conversations with folks who are who are interested in doing so. Yeah, and, and I think and I, I really feel uh, uh, sad that I can't. There's there's so many great questions in the chat and the Q and A um that I that I that I that we can't answer. So we definitely encourage you. Um, to reach out to us. We're pretty easily found on places like Twitter. Um, I'm at Darren Graves. And I think, where are you at? Where are you, Scott? Scott Sider. Mm -hmm. Scott Sider. You can, uh, I think if you, we, I think our emails were on the, uh, you know, on the, uh, one of the slides. So definitely shoot an email. We're easily found, right, via email or otherwise. So please uh, continue to send us your questions um, and we will, we'll do our very best to, to answer them all. Um, but thank you, thank you very, very much uh, for joining us. Um, we uh, urge you again, if you want to get more details about this, um, to definitely uh, uh, buy the book. Uh, we, we put the, in the chat ways to get it, you know, at a discounted price. So thank you very much to the Harvard Ed uh, uh, Publishing Group for doing that for us. And thank you so much to the folks at Harvard Ed Publishing Group too make this possible for us and the folks at the Gutman Library and Harvard Ed School uh, for making this possible. It, it, like the notion that this wouldn't, that wasn't gonna happen was very uh, demoralizing to me when we, we, we had, we had uh, organized this book talk. And now that we've done it virtually, we've gotten way more people I think than we would ever have gotten otherwise. And so we really appreciate this opportunity. Very honored to be the first um, to do it virtually. Um, and, we, and we also hope to see everybody in person soon. We wish everybody well. We hope all you and your loved ones are well during these harrowing times. So thank you very much. Great. Okay. Be well, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I can... Do I stop the recording now, Mayan? Is that what? I will. Oh, okay. Great. Thanks. Great.